title is slightly abbreviated. Yeah, what I thought, well, I came here for the interpretive dance It part. did have interpretive dance, but that's the actual answer to that. <laughs> um, all right, so there's some, there's some big meme that uh, supposedly nobody pays attention to any presenters anymore, so this is like, you're, if you're Twittering, the entire presentation is actually in 140 characters. And by the way, I spent a lot of time, each of those is 140 characters. Uh, we're going to go through um, this, this fable that is the construct of the presentation, Aesop's fable of the frogs who desired a king. Is anybody familiar with that fable, by the way? Uh, talking about the cloud, uh, and then talking, talking about the fable of um, virtualization and cloud computing security, and then how uh, we are um, supposed to deal with all of this. I'm not sure if everybody can see the slides. So Aesop's frogs, um, these frogs disenchanted with their existing leader, uh, wanted a king. They're very, uh, they're, they're kind of sad because they, they, they are looking for an answer to all of their problems. So they appeal to Zeus, who is the, uh, the all-powerful, almighty god of the, of the day. It says, Zeus, we, um, we, we, we desire a king. And Zeus is known for his sense of humor. So what Zeus does is he says, fine, you want a king, you want a solution to all your problems, I'm going to go ahead and send you a king. What he does, he sends down this ball, right? Just a ball. Frogs, first frog swims up to a fountain, because he swims away. Second frog swims up to it, jumps on the So they get kind of pissed off, and they're, they're a little upset at the fact that you know, they asked for a solution to all the problems and got a log. So they, they say, listen, Zeus, we want, no, we, we really want a king. So Zeus ends up being, given a sense of humor, sending a new king, which ends up being uh, a herald. You're not right, you're not recording any later, so I'm good. Can you use one of those mics just so I can get comfortably situated? Yes. It's all right. Don't worry. It's, it's, it's not that important. Uh, so he sends down the heron, uh, and the heron promptly eats the frogs. Right. So this is the the the, the point of all of this. Interestingly enough, was uh, was covered by Thomas Gunn in this uh, his book, the, the Court Revolt, which is the notion of really be careful what you ask for. Right. You ask for a a solution to all your problems. The reality is you may actually get it. Uh, it just may take a form that uh, that doesn't uh, that is not familiar to you. And so that being the case. The, if you, who, who has not heard the word the cloud or the, or the combination of the cloud, right? So the cloud has, has metaphorically jumped the shark, right? Does everybody know where that, where that came from, right? Fonzie, they have no, right? So he jumps the shark. Oh, thank you. Wow. So, uh, what, you know, what the hell is, is, is cloud computing? So I actually filmed a, a video, but I couldn't get done with the editing where I was going to impersonate Vince, the cloud wall guy. But um, the, for me, the purpose of this talk is really within my community, the security community, to be able to get as many people on the same page about what cloud computing really means within the construct of our ability to affect uh, securing it and managing risk. And so when I look at the key ingredients for, for cloud computing and what it means to us, because I can't solve what the business thinks it, it is, and I'm certainly not in a position to affect that change because that's, you know, that's what the press, that's what vendors are doing today, which is really, really confusing things. I look at it as in, in, these, in these five ways. It's the abstraction of infrastructure, right? Making the stuff that makes things tick not necessarily be the things we focus on and look at as being the solution. We don't care about the moving parts as much. The second is resource democratization, the ability to basically take the things that would otherwise be hard bound to the the infrastructure and care less about um, the infrastructure and focus more on the resources and what it means and their availability. The third is then becoming services oriented. So instead of thinking about hardware, instead of thinking about the, the coupling of hardware and software and applications, we think of them as services. Now those two things by themselves aren't particularly new, but what is new when you think about and you hear about cloud computing is this notion of, of taking those three other constructs and introducing um, this notion of self-managed elasticity or dynamism, the ability to really scale up or scale down at a whim based on need, desire, whatever your requirements are. And the, 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 the last portion that's new is then also the way in which we consume and allocate those resources, kind of the all-you-can-eat and pay-by-the-drink method. So the first three aren't particularly new. You can take any technology we've had over the last 20 years and say, yeah, you know, virtualization, SOA, any of the new paradigms, anything with the, that starts with you know, the word paradigm, generally involves those three things. What's new about cloud computing from the perspective of IT and, and, and our world is, are these two, these two bottom items, elasticity 
and how we consume it and how we charge back, allocate it, and or account for its use. Um, that's really important as we go through the presentation. So when you look at the things that make good cloud candidates, things that when you hear about people moving applications and content to the cloud, um, David Linthicum actually did a pretty decent job of rounding up some of the requirements. It says when the processes, apps, and, and data are largely independent, you know, not really coupled, they're not really bound together, uh, it's a pretty decent cloud candidate. When the points of integration and how these things tie together are well defined, you get a pretty good shot at, at, at making it success. When you have a lower level of security, and that's just fine for you, when good enough is good enough, that's a, that's a reasonable um, uh, expectation. When the core, when, when your enterprise, the processes, the technology, uh, the people, and how, they, how, how they're organized uh, are, is healthy, that's good too. Uh, when the web is, or the internet from, from a, from a um, uh, more, more specifically, when a, when a web browser, is what he really meant, is a desired platform for communicating access to your applications and content, is a desired platform, when cost is an issue, when you want to reduce cost, and ultimately when the applications are new. So these all make for good candidates for moving things to the cloud. The converse, which is his next slide, is really the telling point. When you have legacy applications all bound together that require native interfaces that uh, you know, are very ill-defined in terms of integration, uh, the organization is not healthy. I mean, that pretty much sums up most enterprises today. So interestingly enough, there's, there's a lot of the confusion about how do I move my stuff to the cloud without giving up everything is hinged a lot upon our, our, our actual poor, poor processes today and, and the fact that most of the applications, unless you're creating them from scratch, aren't very good candidates for moving to the cloud. So when we start thinking about the things we want to move to the cloud, taking into consideration that abstraction of resources, democratization, um, et cetera, et cetera, people say, well, well what, what is the cloud? And you've seen lots of definitions of it. So the next section is really talking to me uh, about, um, from, from my perspective, about how, how we classify, uh, from a networking and or security person's perspective, what the cloud looks like. So you've got these, these what's called the SPI model. Uh, and that stands basically for the, uh, for the initials here of software as a service, platform as a service, and infrastructure as a service. That's called the SPI model, right? Uh, have you, you've all heard of these? You've all heard of these terms before, right? Um, there are lots of asses in cloud, right? And, and what's really, really important is to figure out when you're, when you're talking to somebody about when they say the cloud or a cloud app, what the hell they mean. So I kind of took upon myself to start this, this effort of, talk, of uh, being able to, and I, I unfortunately use the words taxonomy and ontology, and, and people just really have a hard on for, for some of these definitions. And instead of focusing on what I was trying to accomplish, they, they want to debate terminology. But, but it's, it's really like a nacho seven layer dip problem. And when I started sorting through stuff, you know, I'm, I, I come from a network background, so I'm used to looking at things from like an OSI model perspective, right? So I wanted to be able to find a reference point that allowed me to do that and, and summarize what the cloud looks like from a layers uh, perspective. So if we break down infrastructure as a service, and you look at, uh, at this portion of the slide here, without going into tremendous detail, I built these layers, and, and we went round and round with people in the community and cloud and, and network and security community. Um, to, to kind of arrive at this, at this point, and it's still, still undergoing some, some change. But you have facilities, which are the kind of power, HVAC, the buildings themselves. You have a hardware layer where you can have your compute network and storage things uh, inhabiting. You then have this intertwined layer of abstraction and core connectivity and delivery. And what I mean by that is, and, and the reason they're kind of layered together like this, is abstraction could be virtualization, it could be grid distributed, you know, distributed computing, it could be a way of packaging up operating systems and applications and data, um, which is intertwined in the way in which it's delivered, kind of at a layer two and above perspective. But for cloud and infrastructure as a service, you don't have to have abstraction. You don't have to have virtualization to deliver cloud services. And in fact, if you look at Google, they don't really make use of virtualization at all. And we're gonna get into that in a, in a little while longer. But a, a, as you'll find out, they've become kind of synonymous because the majority of players in the cloud market do use virtualization. But sitting at top of all of this is a set of APIs to manage all of this stuff. This is the infrastructure abstraction layer I was talking about. So that's infrastructure as a service. Is that reasonably clear? Right. So sitting on top of that, when we start thinking about the next layer, which is platform as a service, it's just infrastructure as a service with an integration and middleware layer on top of it. So that integration and middleware layer are things like database, messaging, queuing services, uh, and a series of APIs that allow you to essentially put one thicker layer up here of being able to allow people to build applications on top of your platform. Okay? So there's, very, there's not a huge difference between, from, the, from, a, from a, uh, 
a high-level perspective between infrastructure as a service and platform as a service. But over here, I mean, it, at infrastructure as a service, you've got examples like Amazon's EC2, GoGrid, Flexiscale. At the platform as a service, you've got Google App Engine, Force, Coghead, which is no more. Um, they went out of business. But ultimately, the notion here is that this enables people, although somewhat constrained, to build applications on a platform, right? And so the third layer, when you, when you think of, of, of uh, software as a service, is just integration as a, uh, um, infrastructure as a service, layered on top of platform as a service, with the rest of the stuff that we, that we take, uh, that we need to deliver an application, all bundled up neatly. But the, the entire stack is owned, generally, by the software as a service layer, right? So, so in that particular case, you've got things like salesforce.com, you've got Google Docs, You've got you know, things that you're used to using from an application perspective that, that people generally today, when you look at the press, will define cloud as being software as a service because you're ultimately, unless you're just a pure infrastructure player or you're somebody delivering um, platform, you're generally delivering an application and data. But the way I look at this is this becomes kind of the Annie Oakley decoder ring that we're going to go into later for being able to match up when somebody says, I have this thing, it's in the cloud for you to be able to take it apart, and we'll be able to then start to decode what we need to do from a controls perspective, what we need to do from a process perspective, determine whether or not we can actually secure something that somebody's asking us to move into the cloud. So you may have heard of all sorts of other asses. Storage as a service, integration as a service, virtualization as a service. They're really just combinatorial um, uh, uh, variances of bits and pieces of infrastructure as a service, software as a service, platform as a service, right? So when you hear somebody talk about um, Amazon's S3, that's really storage as a service, right? And storage as a service is really, you could say it's either platform as a service or it's definitely infrastructure as a service. But you can start to take it apart and understand what the hell people mean, especially vendors, when they say, oh, we're in the cloud. So that being the case, I, I wanted to kind of look at what defines on, on, a, on, on, some, on some axes and combinations and difference between um, the, the, uh, the SPI model. So I had three axes. One is kind of built-in features and functionality. Another one is openness. And another one is security. And when you look at infrastructure as a service, uh, or I mean software as a service, you have a high level of integrated security because they own the entire stack from the app down to the physical infrastructure, including the hosting. Um, you have a relatively proprietary platform. It's relatively closed, right? They don't allow an awful lot of extensibility because you're running their application on their infrastructure. Um, from a feature perspective, it's pretty well loaded because they own the stack. So, so that's SaaS. When you look at platform as a service and a balance, really what you're talking about here is you, is you step down a little bit in security because you're opening up via APIs and exposing the platform you have you know, relatively more openness than SaaS because you're inviting people to write applications for you. And then on top of that, the features go down a little bit because you're expecting people to build their own. right? And then from infrastructure as a service, you can guess lower security because you're really protecting the infrastructure more than anything else. Um, high openness because you're allowing anybody to run whatever they want on terms of your infrastructure in many cases, some cases not. Uh, and then ultimately kind of lower on the feature set because you're expecting people to build on their platform. So, why that is important is when you think of from a security perspective, you look at Salesforce. They own the entire stack, right? Total abstraction from you. You just fire up a web browser and you are, that experience, that environment is completely managed by them. Application, data, content, everything. Security is basically their problem. You go out on the stack to something like Google App Engines where you're building your own apps, not so much. You know, vendors that build on Google Apps are responsible for a good amount of the security as part of that offering. And you go down the stack to Amazon EC2, even more so. So the, the golden message here is that when you talk about this, the lower down the stack that cloud provider stops, the more responsible for security you are. Okay? And this is really, really critical because we keep hearing how, in, in some cases, the cloud is more secure or less secure. The funny thing is, without context, this is a really stupid question to ask. Is it more or less secure? If you look at these three companies, software as a service, where security, bundled security is supposed to be the highest out of all of the combinatorial SPIs, okay? Breach, breach, and breach. Okay? Salesforce, breach of data. Google Docs, privacy pollution. Right? Monster.com, data leakage. So interestingly enough, even in the cloud model, the, 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 the offering that ultimately has the most amount of security is the one that's actually suffered the most amount of visible breaches. Right? So I had to put one lol cats in, and I got stood up yesterday. But I think it's, I think it's relatively... Um, it's relatively clear that 
you really have to, again, understand the context of, of, of what the security offering is within, within the actual um, cloud uh, offering. So again, really important. The lower down the stack you go, the more responsible you are. So the, you know, when you hear people talk, and we just heard in, in the keynote this notion of transference of risk, really? I mean, are you really transferring risk when if you're using infrastructure as a service, you're responsible for 98% of the frickin' security anyway? And really all Amazon gives you is basic you know, packet filtering capabilities to wall off the you know, uh, access to, a, to an AMI? No, because you're building all of the security into the host-based image, right? So, so be careful how much you sing this song, especially as a security professional, when people kind of bat back on you to say, we're moving this to the cloud. Okay, what model are we talking about? Because ultimately, you may, or be, you may actually be more exposed, not less. So the transference of risk has to be understanding, as we just heard about in the last talk, what, what deems acceptable risk in the first place. So the differences between, for example, the question always comes up is, hey, okay, cloud versus outsourcing. What is the, what, what are the differences between what, just outsourcing services today and the cloud? Well, I, you know, for me, it comes down to these issues. The types of applications and data that's been considered for outsourcing. Today, we actually hear about people taking any and all of their data, especially in small and mid-range companies, not so much in the larger companies who have asset classification and have more confidential information and maybe more regulatory um, pressure, but the types and applications of data being outsourced, where your assets are. And this is funny because most people, as, we've, as we just heard in the keynote, don't know where their, where their assets are today, uh, and now we're supposed to move them to the cloud where we certainly have no idea where they are, right? Uh, who manages them and how? We're going to see as part of the, the, the exploration of these models that in many cases, given um, the types of uh, management functionality, you, you may, there may be hybrid models of people managing part of the infrastructure as a service portion where you manage the data, security of it. Some of it they manage entirely, you know, everything in, in its entirety, et cetera. Um, the, the next part is really a huge piece, how controls are integrated. You may not be, as we'll find out, be actually able to replicate um, any of the same sorts of network-based controls uh, in an infrastructure as a service play that you do in your networks today, which is kind of a problem. Um, and then this notion, again, of the all-you-can-eat and pay-by-the-drink pay model. So it's a really compelling financial argument. And the things that when you peel back the covers that make people sweat, especially security people sweat at night, is this notion of single tenancy when you own your own data and your own data centers versus multi-tenancy where you are basically looking at shared infrastructure. The notion of isolated data versus commingled data. Dedicated security versus socialist security where basically good enough security spread, up out, spread out over the entire offering is good enough and you're sharing some sort of uh, uh, security capability, and that notion then that always sparks interesting discussion is, is kind of where the, data, where the data, where the applications, where your infrastructure is, on-premise or off-premise. So for me, you know, really cloud comes down to, to money, right? And it's just an economic lubricant. Um, so it, it, it's very hard to, to, to quantify if you don't manage and measure the things that you're trying to express as being um, issues of risk for you, as we just sort of, again referenced in that last talk, um, to, to suggest that this is not a compelling argument of all the money you're going to save. So when, when people, uh, when I've talked to people uh, about um, moving to the cloud, there's absolutely, given the agility and the flexibility and the cost savings for a startup or a small company that wants to basically not invest in hardware anymore and focus on the core competencies, moving to the cloud or clouds is a fantastic idea and relatively easy for them because they, what, they probably end up with more or better security in an offering than they would have had by doing nothing themselves. In an enterprise that has sunk costs and burdened infrastructure and are still depreciating assets over God knows how many years and has huge regulatory pressures, that's, that's, that's not the case, right? That's why you see all this weird resistance between people that are saying, oh, we're moving everything to the cloud, and then you could read an, the article in the same paper on the next page saying, oh my God, this is the worst idea ever. We will never do this. And so I, I kind of picked an example that uses the notion of a, of a relatively uh, mature, large uh, organization and their kind of journey to, a forward-looking journey to the cloud. Um, taking a step back starting maybe two years ago. Uh, if somebody was, was, was in, kind of looking now at where, at where uh, and how they would move to the cloud. So step, you know, step or phase one is kind of this notion of virtualization. You take all these discrete um, 
boxes, pieces of hardware with pieces of software and data on it that have affinity, and you start to um, consolidate and virtualize them, right? So you have lots and lots and lots of individual boxes. So now with virtualization, we're starting to, to consolidate them down into less and less boxes. Once you consolidate, you sprinkle in the magic virtualization fairy dust, and ultimately then what you get is the ability to um, you know, do some very interesting things, um, move stuff around, um, you know, manage uh, your usage uh, more appropriately, um, do some very interesting things associated with uh, disaster recovery and high availability, and reduce costs and get better utilization out of your infrastructure. Pretty clear. So that's kind of phase one. Phase two is something that, um, that is actually a really difficult thing to achieve, and most companies don't actually want to spend or have a hard time digesting what it means to automate and optimize that environment. So we've kind of skipped this phase, interestingly enough, now that the cloud has become uh, pervasive. But this is the notion of taking business process and rules at a governance layer, actually formulating business process extraction uh, as a language, feeding it into an autonomics layer, and then doing really interesting things like getting automated repurposing so that a machine that runs in the daytime at the night with function A at the nighttime runs function B, uh, where you can repurpose off of bare metal, reallocate hardware resources. Essentially, it's an autonomic real-time infrastructure. You might have heard adaptive enterprise, real-time infrastructure. This is really a lot of money, a lot of time, and a lot of investment with a very mature organization. People kind of skip this phase, and they have kind of jump right to the cloud, which strangely enough depends on all of this anyway that usually somebody else manages for you. But assuming that somebody's doing this, step three is this notion of externalize and globalize. And you may ask, you know, what the fuck is that? Well, ultimately, this is where the cloud is confusing things. So, and the reason it's confusing things, and, and, and as a perspective, I, I compare, has everyone heard of this notion of public versus private clouds? Anybody know what it means? The differences, really? Because there's like 15 definitions. So I'm going to give you mine. So when we look at the public cloud today, it's really the inner tubes with a bunch of other people's services. You still have your data center if you're a large organization. There's the all-powerful firewall. You can run whatever operating system virtualized you want out here. So when we think about the cloud today, that's really what we're kind of, that's what we think about. Externally based, internet based services that somebody else runs. And we move our stuff to the cloud, right? External public clouds. That's how, we're, that's, how we're thought to, that's how we're told to think about the cloud today. The, their definition, especially folks like Gartner's, uh, which really, really bugs me, is that you still have exactly the same picture here, but all you're really doing is Amazonizing your internet, which is getting to the point that you've added that kind of getting to the autonomic stage and you're adding some stuff and making it cloud-like internally which to me is kind of a boring value proposition because I really haven't done much different here internally to continue to shrink the footprint of, of that data center. So to me, it's mildly interesting, but the notion of what cloud does for me internally when I can't define what it does for me externally is very troubling. So my definition of private cloud is a little different. We still have the inner tubes, you still have that stuff that exists out there, but really the, the model that is of interest to me is actually paring down what I do in here and, and extending that notion of virtualization and cloud to, res to reside on other people's infrastructure and taking a provider like GoGrid, who basically is a hosting co-location company with the all-you-can-eat uh, and elasticity model glued onto the front side of it. So instead of buying a dedicated server, you're essentially just able to scale up or down as needed. But it's still, a, it's, it's the old co-location hosting model of yesteryear. No real difference with that five load balancers on the front side and a nice interface to manage it. But the point here is that instead of continuing to invest here, because this is an infrastructure as a service play as an example, I still have complete control over my infrastructure. I'm moving it to a third party hosted provider in the cloud, and I can choose to expose it to the outside or the inside or both. So that definition for me makes a lot more sense because from a private cloud perspective, I can choose to keep it private in the way in which it's managed or accessed or the data I put there, but I'm not constrained by doing that over the internet. I'm not constrained by having to use somebody else's stack all the way up to the top. So for me, that's much more attractive because I'm really taking the, be the benefit and premise of cloud in the first place, reducing my footprint, using other people's infrastructure for less cost. So that makes a lot more sense to me. In the long term, you're going to end up with both. This is the hybrid model. I call it cloud of fornication, which is kind of this notion of cloud on cloud on cloud. <laughs> And that's actually the topic of my next Prezo. But the point here is you are going to end up with kind of less footprint here with some data that you can't let go of. Because in reality, we will all have data we just don't let go of. 
Um, some stuff out here and some stuff out here. And you're going to end up, when you think about the cloud, uh, you know, the cloud will end up being you know, all three of these things. This is a forward-looking kind of view, but, and it's going to take a while for enterprises to get there. But again, today, that's the cloud that we, we're getting confused by. But again, infra you know, some infrastructure, some applications, some infrastructure, some platform and applications, you've got to be able to decode what the hell people are talking about. So I think we're going to end up here. So public and private matters, you know, or does it matter? It matters if you're a networking, virtualization, and OS vendor for sure, um, because you know, you're banking on people still buying your equipment somewhere. Um, ultimately, if you're treating security as an element of enterprise uh, architecture, that means you need to be able to really understand where your stuff is, how it's used, and why, and by whom, in order to be able to set policies and, 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 um, and manage this stuff. If you're paying attention to how you're supposed to protect your assets, it's going to matter because of where it's located and how it's treated and held and processed. And ultimately, it, it really is that whole... It's the proof point of reperimatization on steroids, right? So if you get rid of the notion of get rid of, getting rid of your firewalls, which we will still always keep anyway, but the notion of the, the porous perimeter, where is the perimeter in that picture? Since your data, the perimeter really is defined by, to me, where the, my most important assets are, at this point I really don't have much of a perimeter. And we've, we've heard that argument a lot, but this is a really good illustration of it. And the problem that starts to occur here is um, this notion of what, I, of, I, I'm, well, I call it, I, I started calling it this, but now it's, it's used quite a bit. I'm, I'm not sure I, I originated the term, but I like the, the word simplexity, right? It's massive amounts of complexity abstracted and hidden by this wonderful little um, layer that, that you know, we, we ultimately um, call manageability. So it's a stack frog, frog from, it's like playing a game of Jenga, right? The reality is it's cloud on cloud on cloud. And what you get, what's very interesting is, for example, you know, we already have this problem. It's just not called cloud. We depend on layer upon layer upon layer of nested infrastructure and really shitty protocols that just take one little and all the monkeys fall, right? Uh, same thing here. I'll just use frogs instead of monkeys. Um, lots of staggering interdependencies. You know, your frame relay T1 internet provider is really a cloud provider within definition who is stacking on another cloud provider using shared infrastructure, who is managed by another provider who is shared infrastructure, yada, yada, yada. So we're building a really uh, uh, weak foundation. It's a squeezing the balloon problem, right? We're not actually solving a new problem. We're just squeezing it and watching it fart to the other end of the balloon. Um, ultimately, this is a problem because the dynamicism that we are introducing into our ability to scale up and down and shift our data everywhere um, doesn't really uh, match up well with um, static security. And what I mean by that is, um, this ring represents kind of the, I, I couldn't come up with a better layer other than display, but because I, I want to separate how you view and interact with your data versus how the computing is done on the backside with, with ultimately data in terms of centralization versus speed and access to your data. So, you know, we started with mainframes where we had, you know, pretty much dumb but reasonably reliable um, uh, display uh, methodologies. Uh, connecting to centralized data, centralized resources, um, reasonably, I, I guess I should change this, it, it says unreliable and slow, I guess it was quite, it was reasonably reliable and slow at, at that point in time. We moved then ultimately to client server with some stuff in the middle with minis where we, you know, uh, end up with mostly centralized data with stuff now residing on storage platforms at the client side. Then we move to that wonderful web 1.0 phrase, uh, phase, right, where stuff is, you know, distributed in lots of interesting different places. Web 2.0, where stuff is now being shotgunned everywhere, um, it, it, kind of the precursor to cloud. So the very interesting things now with, uh, did I spell Octung wrong, by the way? Does it have an H in it? Yeah, ah, I thought so. Okay, so, sorry. Um, so, so now we have this really weird set of divergent models between the re-centralization of data in the cloud mainframe model, right, even though it's distributed, but with virtualization amount and, and, and mainframe, you're kind of seeing a re-centralization of data, but then with, with incredibly th thick, thin devices that have the, you know, very rich processing environments and the ability to store and hold data, two completely different models for which we, neither, we, we don't have mature ways of dealing with either. So it, it's kind of interesting then that our solutions as we've looked at each one of these models here has been you know, strangely enough, firewalls and SSO. And Gunnar Peterson did a really interesting little thing. He said, for every development that we've had in, prog in programmatic um, evolution from CGI, Perl, ASP, blah, blah, up to Web 2.0, our response has been identical. And strangely enough, if you look at the cloud in all three of the models, in the SPI model, <laughs> that's still our solution. 
it still ultimately comes down to basic packet filtering and some, and some SSL encryption, which isn't really going to work too well. It's not going to save us, strangely enough. Um, what's that? Aren't we doing content filtering? Cont what do you mean by content filtering? We have application Yeah, that seems to be working really well, right? Um, yep. It's still a firewall, is my point. SSL. SSL. Yeah. I mean, the reality is most of SSL, unless you're doing man in the middle with uh, proxies that your browser trusts and intercepting that way on, on reverse, on, on forward proxies, I mean, okay, but reverse proxies don't, you know, don't work. It's, it, it, the ability to inspect encrypted traffic is still an enormous problem and, and will. And that's why, to, to meet's point this morning, that the question of, you asked, uh, what was it, um, Dan, you asked, uh, is uh, uh, traffic analysis versus content inspection? The answer is, yeah, you need both right now because uh, I think, you know, ultimately your visibility as more and more traffic becomes encrypted is less with content inspection. Uh, so you have to start looking at traffic patterns and use some behavioral anomaly and, and gather as much as you can. Um, so, so the fable of, um, of, of where we are with virtualization, VertSec and CloudSec is, is very interesting. And you can read and pick up a, a newspaper article. This was great, right? Network World. Cloud security fears are overblown, some say. And the interesting part here is you've got people, I don't mean to pick on Joseph Tobolsky, director for cloud computing at Ass Enter. Oh, Accenture, sorry. Uh, but he basically says, you know, people are, are creating these lists of security that they don't even have in their own data centers. Yeah, maybe the reason we don't have them in our data centers, does, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't, it means that we don't. So why shouldn't we hold cloud computing to a higher standard? Right? Yeah, no, because he wants to essentially do you know, wonderful audits to tell you you fail and are not PCI compliant so we can charge you lots of money. The, the problem here is that you've got this, which is juxtaposed immediately with this, which says, oh yeah, but security is like in 74% of the people responding of, of, of you know, their fears of moving to the cloud, 75% um, of them say security is definitely a, a, a barrier to entry. You know, so how do I reconcile that? Are we supposed to do nothing? You know, we just sit here continuing to do uh, the same amounts of, you know, the same amounts of nothingness? Well, no, but from, a pers from the perspective of where we are today, we've kind of rushed to embrace virtualization without doing a very good job of solving the problems we've already had. Um, and strangely enough, even in virtualized environments in our own intranets, we at least own the infrastructure and we at least have a chance of getting our arms around the fact that we know where the data is. We've skipped over real-time infrastructure that would actually give us the ability to, to, to automate and provide better control. And we've just now moved to, the, we're moving to the cloud because of the economic lubricant, really stretching every model we have with a complete lack of standards because we're in that innovative uptake cycle, right? I mean, the reality is, what, you know, what could possibly go wrong? Um, I, I, so without, without making this an issue of, uh, uh, you know, one of those doomsday issues, um, when you think of virtualization, I introduced this previously, um, virtual machines have really become the de facto atomic unit of, of cloud computing. So when people now, even though you've got folks like Google who don't use virtualization at all, they use millions of you know, junky bo boxes to essentially serve up your data with really, really advanced, uh, amazing um, you know, distributed applications, but they don't really rely on virtualization when, versus somebody like Amazon who does, either way, most of the time, even though it's not required for cloud, virtualization and cloud are now kind of used synonymously and interchangeably, which is kind of, a, it's kind of disappointing. Um, and it's disappointing because when you look at virtualization, and I don't know how, how many of the rest of you feel this way, but virtualization is really uh, a symptom of the underlying flaws of having modern day operating systems that do a really shitty job of process execution, I mean process uh, um, uh, isolation uh, and, uh, and separation and have really crappy, flawed trust models. So if, I mean, no offense, Adam, to, to, to Microsoft, but it, you know, if we didn't have Microsoft, we wouldn't have virtualization as a market today. Because virtualization as it exists is, was really set there to take advantage of using the CPUs and the resources that were being wasted by operating systems that do a really crappy job on that side, and then trying to ultimately now being, is being sold to say, we will do a better job by introducing virtualization to isolate these crappy operating systems. Not that I'm saying Microsoft is a crappy operating system. I'm just saying ultimately. I've been operating systems for 50 years. Yes, indeed. So I'm just, I'm only picking on Microsoft because you're back there. Um, so, so this is the fundamental foundation of quicksand that we're building upon it. And it's not to be defeatist or dystopic, but the reality is 
um, we are not focusing on the things that matter. In fact, we are really product rich but solution poor. So all of the elements that I talked about in the Four Horsemen pr presentation, about not being able to replicate high availability and resiliency, not being able to integrate security controls the same way that we do, or if at all, in, in various models, the costs associated with it, uh, ultimately, all apply in cloud, but even more so, because we get even more constrained in infrastructure we don't own. So I don't even have some of the options that I have in virtualization. Um, and depending, again, on the types of, of, of cloud services, you may not get feature parity for security at all. Uh, your visibility and ability to deploy becomes very limited. Uh, it may not even be possible. Uh, and what's very, very interesting is that um, if you go down the stack, and we looked at that three access thing I was doing where many of the infrastructure as a service, like Amazon, really constrain what you can actually do at the networking layer, right? Um, it's driving the way in which we actually invest and secure our infrastructure back away from the network again. And this is, uh, so with apologies to Andy Jackwith, he has his hamster wheel of pain, I have my hamster sine wave of pain. And, and for me, this is like how we invest in controls over time, right? So you, you can start at an arbitrary point, but let's say, for example, we're about here right now, where ultimately we've come off of spending an awful lot of money at the network, we're realizing, well, oh, the network hasn't done a really good job of providing visibility because of encryption. So what we really need to do is focus on security. Somebody said applications. Oh, well, the applications are really a bitch to secure because we have crappily written code. We don't know where all of our stuff is. Uh, it's insecure coding practice in the first place. So what we'll do is we'll become more information-centric. Yeah, that's it. Well, the problem with being information-centric is you have to classify your assets. You have to know where they are, uh, right? Which is really, really difficult. Oh, you know what? Forget being information-centric. What we'll do is we'll be user-centric. We'll make it the user's problem. Well, then the users can't do their job because ultimately we, you know, we invoke all of this onerous crap on them that prevents them from doing their job. So we realize, ah, oh, oh, we'll be host-centric. We'll put all this shit on a host with 40, you know, 47 agents, and that will fix the problem. And then the box bogs down to the fact they can't do their work, and they go, oh, you know what? If that user would just click things differently, and so it goes on and on and on. So right now what's interesting is we've kind of skipped right down here, and actually we're heading from the cloud perspective, if you were to interleave a cosine, basically, and look at the intersection of where we are from, uh, uh, from um, uh, the perspective of, of, of cloud uh, versus just straight infrastructure virtualization, the stuff that we used to put in the network uh, is now being put in the host. For example, in Amazon, uh, how do you deploy a web application firewall in Amazon's EC2 service? How do you do that? How do I deploy my checkpoint firewall if I want to manage it the same way externally in a private cloud that I do internally? Can't do that. In fact, you can't even run vulnerability assessment, vulnerability scans. It's a violation of, Google, of uh, Amazon's terms of service. If you run a VA scan in Amazon EC2, they will disable your service because it's a violation of terms of service. So, you know, the practices operationally, depending on where you are up and down the stack, make it very difficult for us to figure out where and how we're going to invest. So, that being said, that was all the kind of bad stuff. There is some very interesting things uh, going on. It's, we're really now, as, as some of these topics are being brought up, people that don't normally talk about security, especially when you're talking about their content, as paired with regulatory pressures, are starting to pay attention to the fact that moving to the cloud might not be that great of an idea, at least not all of our data. Um, we're scrambling and starting to turn rocks over. And so there's some really interesting people that would otherwise not talk about elements of security that are starting to really talk about things that, uh, that we ought to focus on and do differently. Yep, bad things will happen. Really smart people are starting to work on some of these problems. Um, but we're still, you know, with all the innovation and lack of standards, we still have problems there. So much of what you actually already have will work, assuming that you're willing to be reasonable about the sorts of things that are being transferred and put in the cloud, right? Um, setting expectations is really critical, and we're going to get to how we do that as a community uh, in your daily life in, in a couple of minutes. So what should we care about? We should care about that our assets are as well cared for uh, externally as they are internally, which today isn't really saying much, but it would be nice to get to the point that we could at least get parity there. Um, that we have visibility into the state of your information. Assuming that location is going to be difficult to, to kind of like, you know, herding cats, at least understanding how your information is being used, how it's being stored and destroyed across the information lifecycle, just getting a better understanding internally before you ship it off to somebody else to deal with your problem and, and, and transfer risk, to really understand this kind of state of your information. Um, determining what things we might have to do differently 
if we are going to move stuff into the cloud. Uh, and you know, as a first step, moving your, your website that does not traffic and confidential information may not be that big of a deal. Great way to get rid of you know, um, wasted bandwidth and wasted cycles. Transferring your you know, PCI uh, sensitive data to the cloud might not be the best idea. Um, managing service levels, achieving and maintaining compliance is pretty important. And then really dealing with how, uh, the notion of um, <coughs> putting all your eggs uh, in one basket. And, and this was interesting because I, I, I wrote a blog the other day where I went to a, a, the New England Cloud Computing Users Group and there was a startup called Pixely who was talking about how they basically used, they, they don't have any infrastructure themselves, they moved all of their services into the cloud, it's fantastic, we're able to focus on our core competencies, deliver our applications very quickly, you don't have to buy any infrastructure. At the end of all of that, I kind of raised my hand and I said, yeah, listen, I, I, I'm not knocking Amazon and their service levels or their ability to deliver service, but how do you deal with a single provider? You're, you, you have put all your eggs in one basket. And yeah, they're reliable, but you put all your eggs in one basket. And the CTO kind of bowed his head and said, well, you know, kind of funny you say that because the day we had, we launched and had our company on the front page of the Wall Street Journal and the Boston Globe is when Amazon had their eight-hour outage, okay? And the notion of proprietary lock-in, you can go on debates, and yeah, the AMI image still takes a CentOS or a Windows image that you could build and standardize on and deploy somewhere else, but the real issue is how do I then redirect, how do I, th all that infrastructure that we use today with BGP and DNS and CDNs and load balancing, if I want to do, and we'll get to this a little bit later, but I don't have portability and resiliency the way I do with normal non-cloudy internet infrastructure. So this notion of putting all your eggs in one basket from a privacy confidentiality perspective is, is, is frightening. From a resiliency and reliability perspective, which is part, if I remember my CISSP test, it was, there was an A in there, right? The availability was, is also one of the things we're supposed to, uh, we're supposed to deal with. So, that, you know, all of the, 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 the bad stuff aside, I think the cloud holds lots of very interesting opportunities in terms of warms and fuzzies. It can actually provide you, depending on what model you're using, the ability to centralize your data, in which case you could suggest you might actually have more control over it if it's in one place. Might be more attractive target too. It also leads to the potential of better segmentation of data and applications, especially if you looked at some of the things that make the adoption of moving something to the cloud where you have decoupled apps from the data itself, you're able to essentially be, think about architecture a little bit more holistically, right? Our service isn't gonna go down because there's a database sitting under that developer's desk. We, we've ultimately exposed and gotten better visibility, better login and accountability, given what, we're, what, we, uh, what we may be given by the cloud provider. Standardized images for asset deployments, pretty good. Uh, better resilience to attack and streamline incident response. If Amazon shuts down you for uh, VA scans, uh, you know, and map scans, what have you, they do a pretty decent job of shutting down. I mean, unfortunately, it means shutting you down, but, you know, your ability to, to, to be resilient to attack given their, you know, firewalling of instances, et cetera, may be actually uh, better because you're essentially dealing with uh, people who have much more invested in their infrastructure than you might in terms of security. More streamlined audit and compliance. If you've done a better job of documenting, a better job of system analysis, you understand how things are interconnected, it'll be easier for you to uh, essentially be audited. Uh, more visibility to process, faster deployment of applications and services, more innovative so solutions. This is all goodness, right? This is, these are all things that ultimately, um, if you are thinking about moving to the cloud for all the right reasons, will force you, it's a fantastic forcing function to start doing things the way you ought to be doing them. Anyway. So there are some areas of concern, of course. Um, trust, and I put the T there in rust, because I see, you know, for me, it's a corrosion of trust boundaries uh, based on models that are flawed in the first place. So this intranet versus extranet, internal versus outside, that, that model simply doesn't work anymore. And it's not going to work, especially when now you don't even have control over your data. So, so this, is, this is obviously an issue. Um, who you trust and how, the private cloud versus public cloud issue comes back into play again. Are you exposing and connecting that private cloud to the internet, or is it just an outsourced repository for your data? And who do I allow access to and how? And does that third party provider have access to that content? I mean, basic, basic image, uh, issues. Segreda segregation in a multi-tenant environment. How do you prove, how do you prove that your data is separate from mine? Google Docs just basically blew that one out of the water last week. You know, we are told that it is segmented and separate and segregated. It is not. It's co-located. In fact, in many cases, it's not even encrypted. 
right? On Amazon EC2, your data is not encrypted unless you happen to encrypt it. They don't do that on S3, for example, on the backside in the stores. You, you're responsible for that. So, you know, what that trust, what these trust boundaries look like and how those trust models are executed versus how your data is segregated is pretty darn important, which leads to confidentiality and privacy. You know, huge issues. Even if, you know, even if you're happy with the fact that the types of data you're, you're, you're exposing is not particularly critical or would cause breach, the reality is it's still your data. Should somebody else be looking at it? Pretty, I mean, visibility and manageability are huge issues. Because, for example, in a platform as a service or infrastructure as a service, you are only given as much visibility and manageability as the APIs allow. You don't have control over all your infrastructure because from the perspective of the definition of cloud, you're not supposed to. Right? You don't care, but you do. And in the long term, you will. That's why you have people like GoGrid branding that they have F5 load balancers in the front side of their network. Why? Because I have an emotional attachment to F5 load balancers. Done a good job for me before, could do a good job in the cloud. Remember the Cisco powered network? I bet you dollars to donuts you'll see a Cisco powered cloud. Why? Because you really are interested in what's powering the infrastructure. Funny thing is, I, I, I got called in to do uh, an interesting, well, Turns out that there was a there was a company that was outsourcing uh, their service to somebody in India as a cloud provider, who in turn was outsourcing their service to somebody in China. Okay, oh, but I don't care because my infrastructure is it's in the cloud. Well, you know I do care. I care where it is. I care what it is. I care how you're implementing access control, um, portability, and interoperability. We talked about this a little bit today. Uh, if you want to um, utilize multiple cloud providers, it is a giant cluster to get this working the way you need it to. You ultimately have to layer cloud upon cloud on cloud. I have an illustration. Mike Bertain on my website did a very interesting thing where he, he showed how he did his host. He builds uh, an entire web hosting business on the cloud. Doesn't own anything. And uh, he essentially <coughs> uses um, uh, a, a, D, a dynamic DNS provider, um, Ultra DNS, to deal with dynamic DNS with, with that function in terms of triangulation. He uses uh, Akamai for a uh, CDN, which is stacked on the front side of that, which in turn feeds off and feeds to, uh, for, for non-static um, uh, data, to EC2 instances running in Amazon. Cloud upon cloud upon cloud. Now, if you wanted to add somebody outside of Amazon, essentially then you're really just dealing with a redirection layer that kind of acts as a traffic cop to point towards another cloud provider. Assuming that, you know, again, it's your responsibility to however secure all of that shit in the backside and make sure that the images, that the AMI image is just as secure as that VMware image running over here, which is just as secure as the one running on top of Xen. Still your problem, one way or another, in the infrastructure layer. Now, if you're talking about uh, software as a service, not so much, because that's their job, right? So you don't really worry about that. But as further you go down the stack, that becomes really important. So we start seeing in the virtualization space stuff like OVF, the Open Virtualization Format, which gets some standardization between the ability to make images portable, not really real time, but somebody made the, uh, Gerhard, you made the um, point yesterday, you said as, uh, uh, as standards start to creep into the cloud, uh, innovation will stop. Maybe innovation at certain levels. I think ultimately exposes a layer for business opportunities for that middleware, that traffic cop, that redirection with connectors to all of these other cloud providers. Makes for a very, very interesting opportunity. That's huge. Reliability and resiliency goes without saying. If Amazon goes down for eight hours, you're out of business, period. You can strip out that CentOS image and try to get it on a hosting provider and change your DNS and hope the TTL is low enough that you can do a refresh. You're out of business. That's a problem. Identity is huge, you know, we, we've had, the, but we've had this, pro I mean, no, no news here. You know, but from a cloud perspective, if I'm using data, a great example for me is, let's say I outsource my applications infrastructure to a third party provider. If most of my things like service accounts and application accounts are based on Active Directory internally within my infrastructure, how do I, do I replicate active, my Active Directory to a hosting provider so I can get parity between being able to identify that Bob is still Bob, irrespective of where he comes from, from the inside or the outside? How do I deal with federated identity across cloud providers that aren't federated in the first place? Right, so this, to me, is enormous because if your software is a service, you know, we've seen Salesforce, for example, has connectors where they will create through a VPN a pipe right into your Active Directory so that Bob can log in as Bob in the morning through his web browser right, or through some business integration uh, piece of middleware.
But that's scary, right? This is a real big problem and will be continue to be. And then obviously compliance. Um, I put up a funny blog uh, a couple months ago, a rhetorical question about saying, you know, hey, I have an entire business that uh, I've moved to the cloud. I need a QSA to come and assess me to tell me if I'm PCI compliant. And what was really hysterical was the total polarization of views between QSAs, people in the business, who, who basically were arguing that you could never be PCI compliant in the cloud, or, well, it depends on the question of scope, and, oh, it's really subjective, and if you only do these three things and sprinkle this dust, you know, really, really interesting stuff. So compliance is going to be really fun. You've already seen press releases by people saying, if you use our cloud service, you're, you're be compliant. Right? So we're already seeing that sort of marketing creep into, uh, into the issues. Um, so, the, you know, I said something about a fable. The fable here is really, the, the fable is that we're, we're supposedly screwed from a security perspective by the, crowd, by the cloud. The reality is that we're not, and in honor of Mr. Raynham, I, I, I kind of butchered his phrase, you know, we are just as insecure now and will be in, in the future as we have always been. Right? It was the same set of problems, just amplified, it's just moving around, squeezing the balloon. So, from the perspective of, um, of, of what we're going to ultimately do about it, uh, we'll get to that in a minute. But I thought that I would annoy people based on content yesterday who hate uh, new labels for old things by uh, playing uh, security bingo, uh, by inventing um, some, new, um, some new attacks. So, so the first one, or, or threat vectors, the first one I call meat cloud, which is using the mechanical Turk to be a maniacal jerk. So this is an instance, for example, of where if, if, if I steal, if I'm, if I'm a member of the Russian business network, and I have 200,000 credit cards with credit lines of, I don't know, five grand, and I sign up for an Amazon account, right? And I say, hmm, you know, I would like to either outsource the, the uh, cracking of identity theft uh, to my, my fellow friends in, uh, in name third world country here. Um, I can essentially use the compute resources now and not have to depend on crappy infrastructure of, of these guys that have, you know, x86, uh, you know, the, AT machines, now I have all the power of tens of thousands of virtual machines at my service to essentially use mechanical Turk services using stolen credit cards. Right? Fantastic. Anti, uh, um, spam and phishing, oh, it's awesome. You can essentially use this as a fantastic um, uh, uh, carrier to do all sorts of new interesting things that otherwise, you, you know, we saw yesterday in, um, in uh, Jose's talk the, uh, the notion that, uh, you know, people were writing crappy little... Um, uh, Windows scripts to do, you know, pings of death. Well, I mean, this is the same equivalent now. I got these fantastic, it, it makes it even easier. Here, just run this code for me, please. Thank you very much. Next one, cloud flux. I call using fast flux botnets in the cloud. So I take those same stolen credit cards and I sign up for 7,000, 70,000 Amazon EC2 instances. And I have an image that I put on uh, in a torrent that says download this and load it into the instance, please. <coughs> And they load this thing up, and I have a botnet that, given elasticity, I can scale to hundreds of thousands of nodes and fast flux via DNS in fucking milliseconds. You're going to shut down Amazon? To shut? No, oh, this is awesome. So fast flux botnet, cloud flux. I think this is fantastic. So all the Russian business network, uh, no, new opportunity for you. Leapfrog. One of the things we're going to ultimately see is... There's, there's some really cool technology like uh, from Cohesive FT, which takes the notion of kind of VPNs on storage that are aware of multiple clouds, and they interconnect your private data centers to the different cloud providers. So your database will be back at headquarters, your web instances will be over here and over here and over here, and they're all tied together. Well, the beauty is, given the fact that the way these, these VPNs work, is it, I, essentially being able to utilize the cloud to leapfrog, as you can today in most intranets, which are kind of if you have internal access, it's great, but most of these people are essentially deploying crappy stateful firewalling in the front side of their, uh, of their, of their web farms, or better yet, still, are, since they can't deploy web application firewalls and they don't write good code, get SQL injection, I get all the way back, and I can essentially hop around and start using your infrastructure, even though it's not your infrastructure. Um, Cloud-based uh, cloud vMotion poison potion. So um, this is kind of a VMware-based vCloud. So vCloud is, is, uh, is uh, VMware's um, cloud offering of taking their next generation virtual data center operating system and exposing it outward. And one of the issues with, with uh, one of the opt uh, neat features of, of VMware is this notion of vMotion, which allows you to take a, uh, a virtual image, virtual machine, and move it 
onto another physical host. Today constrained by layer two capabilities, but now if you look at the, uh, the ability to um, take some of these new Nexus switches, which treat multiple switches as one, virtual, as one giant virtual switch, I can extend VLAN layer two over dark fiber or MPLS and make it look like it's in the same VLAN. So that constraint goes away. So ultimately, if you care about infrastructure, and I start using vMotion exposed externally to move between virtual machines between cloud providers, one of the things that happens is all that data with vMotion is sent in the clear. Everything, machine state, configurations, content, data at the time that it was frozen and moved, they don't use encryption because it imposes too much latency in the, in the chunk uh, differentials of, of being able to know when it started and when it stopped. So, it, so uh, John, oh, I forgot his last name, Obu, Obu, he did this really interesting thing with Zen and VMware where you can basically do a man in the middle and you can actually change data in transit while things are being vMotioned and or sniff traffic. It's awesome. So vMotion po uh, poison potion. And then one that, that, that sparked all sorts of uh, great debate, I brought up this notion of EDOS. It's kind of a version of DDoS, but it's economic denial of sustainability, not denial of service, which is to say you signed up for Amazon because you thought that this was going to save you a bunch of money uh, because I only pay for what I use. Well, what if I start doing things transactionally that really make the compute and or storage on the backside start to skyrocket? So you're a startup, and you got your loan from your mom, and you're, you're able to budget, you know, 200 bucks a month. Your Amazon bill comes next month and you're my biggest competitor and I've just driven your usage up that you can't transactionally associate good versus bad from and your bill is now 20 grand. You are now long, you, you're out of business. So all of the flexibility and dy uh, dynamicism without constraint and understanding of transactionally what is occurring, which you have very little insight to unless you engineer it into your applications, you have some pretty interesting opportunities. So, so I bring these things up only to piss people off who hate new names for old problems, but I think there are some really, really fun, interesting things that we're going to see coming out of cloud computing uh, pretty soon. So how do we deal with all this stuff? So if we look at these key ingredients again and how we secure them today, the abstraction of infrastructure, resource democratization, service-oriented, elasticity, and utility model, and we look at what we have available today, you know, you say, how are we doing? What, what, is it, what, what do I have in my arsenal? How do I take the catalog of compensating controls? Because ultimately, regardless of whether people say it's, you know, this people, process, and technology, we are going to trend towards technology solving these problems. Policy ain't going to help you very much when people are moving shit to the cloud like this anyway. So I am taking a controls-based approach, and you can argue with me if you like, but that's what most people here expect. So how do I take my catalog of controls and move them into the environment in, in all three of these examples? And the reality is, as I've shown, you may not be able to or even need to because you may, be able to be, you may be supplemented by the provider. So what I did was I took that model, that cloud model, and I just said, look, a basic recipe for me is that each one of these layers making a catalog of what I have in my security arsenal already. So at the facilities layer, we have physical security, plant security, closed circuit TV, guards, you know, burning oil, what have you. At the compute and storage level, you have everything from host space firewalls, HIDs, HIPs, integrity, file management, log management, encryption, LUN masking on storage, uh, trusted computing, you've got uh, you know, hardware roots of trust that are coming into play now, uh, APIs that allow you to essentially utilize uh, underlying chipsets, um, network layer, all the NIDs, NIPs, firewalls, uh, you know, anti-DDoS tools, quality of service, DNSSEC. Uh, management, GRC, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the point here is that when you, when you determine what, what the service is that you're interested in or that the business is interested in moving, rather than freaking out and just saying, no, we can't do that, the, a better approach is essentially saying, oh, this is infrastructure as a service, which kind of ends right about here. Out of my catalog of controls, based on the information that I know that will be moving and being populated in that service, here's what I have. Or better yet, there's one, one more thing that I wasn't able to fit on the screen, which is the list of, for example, PCI and compliance, right? PCI says I've got to have, for example, a web application firewall. So it's very easy to say that in this case, if I'm using EC2, the Amazon, and I have a requirement for PCI-based um, uh, protection, uh, protection uh, and compliance, uh, and I need a web application firewall, I don't have one internally, uh, do you have one, Amazon? No, you don't. Oh, you don't. Well, that is a very good argument, for example, of either trying to find another compensating control or being able to make a rational expression to say, guys, Mr. Business, it's your decision. 
But it clearly says right here, I need a WAF. I can't use a WAF. It's physically impossible for me to do so. Please sign here saying you want to do this. Okay, so for me, the, building, the reason I built this model was to try to align these two things and then slap compliance on the side of it or whatever you want on the other side and unite the models in ways that we can understand from an OSI-like model. Right, so so if you, when you get the Prezo and or you go to, the, go to my blog and you read up, I'm going I'm to kind of further expand the definitions of these with better examples because there's question marks up here. But, um, so that you can kind of take this as the Annie Oakley decoder ring and be able to really, when somebody says, oh, we're a cloud provider, oh, yeah? What are you? You'll, even if they can't answer that for you, you'll be able to answer it based on the definition of service, and hopefully that will be helpful. So break glass and apply, apply common sense. You already have most of what you need from the perspective of making risk assessments and making good decisions. You may not have all the security capabilities to, to, to protect the information, but if we're talking about managing risk, that's part of the trade-off here, right? So you have a risk assessment methodology, right? You classify your data and content, right? You segment your data and applications and content, right? Well, it has nothing to do with the cloud, but you better. Uh, you really need to make sure that when, uh, and this is a key point. For me, when I evaluate a cloud provider, I apply the same level of diligence I will if I was outsourcing anything. There's not really a lot of difference. If you, can, if you can go back to that last model and you cut through the hype of what the cloud is, then you're able to ask intelligent questions. So the same outsourcing methodology, whether it's a standard that you borrow, whether it's six questions off the back of a napkin, still applies. It's completely relevant once you get past the fluff, right? So you ask them about service levels, which, by the way, if you look at Amazon EC2, Gerhard and I had this, article, this uh, discussion the other day, their SLA is three nines. That's like 80s SLAs, right? We're in the enterprise supposed to be held to five nines. Now, we may not ever achieve that, Right? And people say, well, they're much better at hosting and reliability than I am, and their downtime statistics kind of prove that. But still, if I'm interested in holding somebody's feet to the fire, is three nines really acceptable to you? Are you going to bank your business on three nines availability? Maybe, maybe not. Um, the challenge is, again, to match those business security requirements against that model and do that gap analysis. I simply don't have access to those controls. I can't deploy it the same way. Each of them provide this delicate balance of openness, flexibility. Uh, uh, security and control and extensibility, so you need to make sure you understand that. Go back as you're assessing the things the business wants to move to the cloud and look at that list that David Linthicum said of things that are ready to be moved to the cloud. Right? If it requires a native interface, if the, thing, if the abstraction points are not, I mean, if the points of integration are not well defined, if it's not mature processes, uh, you will be pleasantly surprised by the lack of suck when you, or the, you know, the, the lack of change when you move from your internal infrastructure to somebody else's. Right? You're not, it, it's not going to change much. Uh, and then regardless, this is the key point. You are absolutely still required for some level of security. The transference of risk only goes so far as your ability to understand what you have in the first place. So this is really, really important. So the other thing that's really important, once you realize that this, again, is pretty much what we do today anyway, once we've cut through the fluff of cloud, is, is to get involved. Some of these groups get really uh, annoying, these Google groups, because they're a bunch, bunch of people, mostly vendors, um, uh, you know, crossing the streams, basically arguing with each other. But they're very, very interesting perspectives about what some of these vendors and customers and think tanks are doing. Attend a local cloud camp. Uh, we are going to try to uh, organize a, a cloud camp in Boston for later mid this year, um, which will bring together vendors and users and all sorts. It's a very interesting um, um, uh, opportunity uh, for you to kind of get the straight dope and skinny on some of, of, some of the goings on from, from vendors. Craig Balding, a friend of mine, at, um, has a great blog, um, writes uh, some very interesting things, it just did an analysis on the, uh, the Google Docs um, uh, privacy issue. And then um, my blog, I tend to rant quite a bit about this stuff and virtualization, how it applies. So I, for one, welcome my, no do my new dark overlords. I think that cloud is a um, fantastic set of opportunity. Um, I think it uh, gives us the opportunity to really force, uh, as a function, some of the things that we ought to be working on anyway. And once you just get rid of that, that lexicon, that definitional issue of what is or isn't the cloud as it relates to what it is I'm supposed to be doing, it's not that difficult. Technologically, we're not caught up yet, but you can still make rational decisions. So anyway, that's the end of my prezzo. Uh, if you have any questions or comments or things to hurl at me, uh, 67 slides. One, 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 60 minutes. Told you. OK, well, anyway. Yes? Mm -hmm. 
Oh, I think that must have been me because I've had that attack done to me. Really? Yeah. Meat cloud. I love it. I, I love. I just. I thought it was kind of cool. I don't think I invented it, but I like the name of it anyway. Anything else? Sweet. So you're all cloudies now. Oh, hi, Dan. <laughs> I'm thinking back, it's like uh, 25 years when someone first said, you know, obscurity is not security. Mm -hmm. Yet you're describing stuff that has a remarkable amount of obscurity. Absolutely. Do you get any benefit out of that? Well, yeah, you know, that's a great question. So Dan's question was, um, I've described a lot of stuff uh, through abstraction and, and cloud that, uh, that offers, um, you know, a lot of obscurity and does that actually contribute to, uh, to security? Um, Boy, how do I answer this and seem witty at the same time? Uh, that's so, so for me, I, I think as part and practice of, of, um, of continuing to do business the way we do business, which is actually not understanding what the hell it is we're really securing and how we do it, um, then yeah, we get, I think, the same level of benefit we do today. I think um, or also, especially now that some of that obscurity by the abstraction of infrastructure um, makes it more difficult in some terms to potentially penetrate that. Like squid yeah, like squid ink. Yeah, but but at the same point in time, I think as we standardize, if the APIs become more exposed, like what's happening in virtualization today. Virtualization started with hypervisors that were really thin and di like just would not talk to even the apps or the VMs that ran on top of them. Right? They were very very hardened. Well, to integrate security and better functionality and all of these wonderful features of flexibility and agility, they're opening the hypervisors up exposing them with the APIs, and now in VMware's case, for example, allowing you to run third-party code in my kernel, which sadly is the same sets of problems we've had. You know, so, so I think the, the obscurity will ultimately, upon standardization, um, become less obscure because, again, people will call for standard. They want to know what that infrastructure is, that F5 or Cisco, in which case the attack vectors will be will attack the weakest links like we always have, right? In terms of that infrastructure will become pretty apparent in terms of what's powering it. So we'll go for a buffer overflow of device A that is powering that entire Jenga stack. So to a point, yeah. Um, but to Marcus's quote, I think we're, we are and will always be in the same spot. It's just a kind of a delay mechanism. Hi, Adam. Hey, you talked a little bit about transfer and risk to cloud vendors. Yeah. So you notice there was a question mark at the end of that, right? It wasn't a statement. It was really a question. Because I, I like you, if you look at what they actually accept in terms of transference of risk, uh -huh. it, it's, hey, you know, we have three nines. We do the best we can. Um, we are not liable for the breaches of your data. Now, Salesforce, for example, says, we'll do, uh, or, or, uh, we'll, we'll do the best we can. And if you're down, we'll give you some money back. Doesn't say anything about the confidentiality of it, right? They've got a SAS 70 type 2, so we must be secure. Um, uh, so, so, yeah, that notion, I, I'm actually more interested in the middle piece, which is how the people assessing the, uh, the providers of cloud uh, are now being um, kind of thought about or, or thought about leaning on them as having, well, you said that these guys were PCI compliant. So the last couple of big breaches we've had, right, supposedly the, the customers were PCI compliant. Well, how do, you, how do you ascertain known state between the time in which they were certified and the breach occurred? So I'm really interested in how the assessors are held liable and or risk is transferred to them just as much as the customer or the provider. I, I, don't, I, I really think that, that there's not a lot of transference of risk. I like to think that people say there are. If you're a large company, you can write in financial and or legal remuneration for issues, but it doesn't matter. Once data is gone, it's gone. You're screwed, right? I mean, you still have to pay the fines if you're the company. I don't see anybody that will accept risk for your data leaking for the most part. I mean, I, I'm sure big companies can do it, but I, I'd love to, I, I've never seen it. It's really easy to accept risk. It's hard to make good on it when it uh, fails. That's, okay, so, <laughs> I was just thinking, yes. There's a business model here for cloud where we'll take your risk and then if something goes wrong, we'll default. Right, yes. I there was a medical um, bill provider who did exactly that. Uh, they're one of the only companies that went out of business after Huh. Well, he said it much better than I did, but that's normal, so. Yeah, that's it. Thanks, guys. And girls.
Good seeing you, Dan. Thank, Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Probably most scary focus. Oh, hey, how are you? Good. Very smart guy. Yeah. Oh, come on. So it seems. Just a bunch of, just, <laughs> just a bunch of common sense crap. Yeah. He's actually able to talk with him sitting right there. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. Anyway, uh, I'll contact you. Oh, yeah, please do. You might raise the phone. Okay. No worries. Yeah, just email me. Call me. Whatever. Oh, great. I, you know, for me, I, I, uh, I love just talking about those high-level issues. But, you know. <laughs> Well, I want, I want, I want, I want her to repeat that because I haven't given that one before. This is my first time giving this one. I hope it was not too boring for people that are tech and not too over the top for people to